So let's get started. Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Saskatchewan Municipal Elections and why you should care about them. My name is Keith Comstock and I'm an executive in residence at the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. I'm very pleased to be your moderator for today's event and we're absolutely delighted that you're all here. When you start planning something like this, there's always that nagging doubt in the back of your mind that maybe you and the panelists and whoever from the school is participating might be the only ones on the line. So we're really Really happy that you're here and we hope you enjoy the afternoon. We're looking forward to some good debate. The Johnson Choyama Graduate School is a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy administration. We are a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan and we love we really like that our, our partnership is based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that really defines Saskatchewan as a province. Since the school's inception in 2007, it has swiftly become one of Canada's leading public policy schools for educating graduate students and public servants interested in and devoted to advancing public value. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place online, Johnson Shoyama's physical home is located both on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories and the traditional homeland of the Métis. As I mentioned at the outset, to help our event run smoothly, we ask that all attendees stay muted and please turn off your video to save bandwidth during the formal presentation of our event. Please feel free to turn your videos back on for the Q&A session and uh, it, it, it's, it doesn't always uh, present a problem, but if you're having uh, bandwidth problems in your own location, sometimes turning off your video is the way to, is the way to solve that. Our format today's, uh, for today's presentation is, uh, is pretty standard. We have uh, four distinguished panelists with us this afternoon. We're going to give them an opportunity to present some views and opinions on some issues around the municipal elections that we're coming up uh, next week. Uh, we're going to take about a half an hour, maybe as much as 40 minutes to talk about some of those issues. Uh, and uh, there'll be a mix of presentations and comments from our, from our panelists and some questions uh, from me as well. Following the presentations, our panel is going to entertain questions from the, uh, from the audience. So if you would like to ask a question, please use Zoom's chat function to send your question to me, Keith Comstock, and I will read out your question. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. If, uh, if they are um, uh, appropriate, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll go to them early and we'll just try and play it by ear a little bit and, and try and make the best use of our time. If you have any logistical questions during the presentations, don't hesitate to send a message to Karen Jost or LaForge via the chat function as well. She will try and uh, give you a hand with that. Please note that as with all of our public lectures, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for, you, for viewing on the JSGS website at a later date. So now that the formalities are out of the way, uh, let's get started. While I suspect that most of you attending today have more than a passing interest in municipal politics, the folks on our panel are going to be very familiar to you. I am pleased, however, to introduce them to you in alphabetical order. First of all, Malcolm Eaton. Malcolm uh, refers to himself as uh, the old gray mayor of Humboldt. He's a retired educator, uh, uh, a private consultant in his spare time now, and uh, we're delighted that he's here and uh, helping us out. Next on our list in alphabetical order is Deb Higgins, of course, former MLA for Moose Jaw Waccamaw, former mayor of Moose Jaw, lots of experience on the SUMA board and, uh, and a distinguished career both in provincial and municipal politics. Third on our list is Mike O'Donnell, another retired educator. What is it about you retired educators in municipal <laughs> politics? Is there some correlation there? Maybe we can delve into that as we go this afternoon. <laughs> Mike is a uh, as a recently uh, as as recently as last week uh, finished his career as a counselor with the city of Regina, and uh, Mike, it's great to see you here today, my friend. Last and certainly not least, Tiffany Paulson, who is a lawyer and a former Saskatoon city councillor. Tiffany has uh, as well tons of experience on the SUMA board and uh, as a very uh, distinguished career and a much sought after speaker on uh, not only just municipal topics, but lots of others as well. So we're delighted that you're all here today. We're looking forward to an interesting and engaging discussion. Let's start giving each panelist some brief, uh, some time to make some brief opening remarks and we'll stick to the alphabetical order for now. Uh, Malcolm, we'll let you uh, have the floor first. All right, uh, hello everybody. I'm delighted to be here. This is, uh, this is going to be interesting and fun. And uh, I certainly never imagined uh, quite a few years ago when I was elected to council and, and then became mayor, uh, 
that I would have this, what's turned out to be a lifelong interest and passion for municipal uh, uh, affairs and municipal matters in, in our province and beyond. What I'd like to share with you first is just how excited I am about my hometown of Humboldt. Uh, we have a, a, a campaign for mayor going on with two uh, uh, current councillors, incumbent councillors running for mayor. So we have a great contest going on there. And we have 14 council candidates, three of which are incumbents, seven of which are female. I'm just so impressed with the diversity, both in terms of gender, uh, youth, experience and backgrounds. Wow, this is uh, just a great election for our community. I'm so impressed with what's going on. <laughs> on the provincial scene, I, I, having spent quite a bit of time with the city mayor's caucus in my day as mayor, I'm watching what is going on in our 13 cities. We have only one mayor by acclamation and that's the uh, city of Meadow Lake. And beyond the three major cities, there's some very interesting contests for the mayor's chair, North Battleford with five candidates, Weber and Moose Jaw with three, there's certainly some potential for new faces around the city mayor's caucus uh, table in, in Saskatchewan. Lots of other contests as I've been watching and trying to find out what's going on in different communities around the province. So uh, with that, I'm looking forward to participating in the panel this afternoon and uh, looking forward to the conversation and uh, the discussion and, and things that I can learn as well. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Malcolm, and I appreciate that. One of uh, one of the premises uh, that we put in our uh, in our advertising for this particular forum was that maybe people ought ought to pay more attention to municipal politics, and maybe sometimes we don't get the interest in them that that they deserve. And per perhaps we'll we'll explore that a little bit later on this afternoon, and, and talking about the, the issues that you've raised and the, and whether or not we're seeing a resurgence in the interest in municipal politics just from the number of of uh, people that are running for office. Deb uh, H comes after uh, almost after E in the alphabet. So we'll turn to you next. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. I'm looking forward to this afternoon's discussion and the questions to follow. Hopefully there will be quite a few. Um, as you've said, I've had the privilege to serve in both provincial and municipal politics. And one of the things that's always interested me is that municipal politicians deal with most of the same topics that provincial governments and will deal with, but on a different scale, of course, but municipalities do so with substantially less resources. And I don't mean just financial resources, but also on the research and policy side, municipal governments are considerably smaller, especially when you get into smaller cities and the rural uh, areas of the province. So then we rely more on the municipalities of Saskatchewan and SARM, our provincial kind of organizations. And when you look back, um, municipalities really only dealt with road, sewer, water, fire, police, kind of the basics of, of life. Uh, but in the last number of years, that's really expanded. Uh, we're dealing with more issues and a broader range of problems that expand well beyond that basic service. Um, so that's, it's gonna be interesting to touch on some of those this afternoon. And as Malcolm said, we've got three candidates running for mayor in Moose Jaw, so that's made it much more interesting. And also 16 candidates uh, for council, for six positions on council. So it's been an interesting few weeks and next Monday is gonna be exciting to see what happens. Anyway. That's about it. Okay, thanks, Deb. Appreciate that. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll have a. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what folks think about this notion of resources and and the plethora of problems that municipalities are mm -hmm. are are facing these days. We'll uh, we'll delve into that a little bit more deeply, and uh, we'll turn now to uh, Mike O'Donnell for your opening remarks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Keith. Welcome, everyone. Pleased to be included in the discussion. Um, a simple report about Regina in that we have 50 people running for council, which is a pretty strong number. We have a mayoralty race, which we really haven't had for probably the last four or five elections. So there seems to be a, an evolving three-way race there. 
and something rather unique in terms of a mayor. There is only, to my knowledge, only one female mayor across Western Canada in terms of major cities, and we have a lady challenging there. So that has um, helped our situation. Uh, in Keith's opening comments, he used a word that I want to dwell on for a second. It's called policy. As I've listened to all of the candidates, who, because they've been public about what they're trying to run for, the notion of policy isn't always part of what they're offering. They, in fact, go into many directions. The notion of what our core services has not come up once in any discussion that I've heard of late. And so we have uh, seen and uh, certainly will feel that councillors are looking at expanding that, that world. And of course, as well said and well understood, our resources are limited. So I, lo I look forward to um, one positive that may come out of what's occurring to the south of us. And that is that they have got the people out to vote. They're, whether it's because of issue or personality or whatever, people turned out to vote. I'm really hoping that that will uh, stray all the way up to Regina and Saskatchewan and people will in fact get engaged. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Mike, and time will tell on that, but it will be an interesting, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, voter turnout in Regina and, and in most of the communities across Saskatchewan was was 20% or perhaps a little better in the 2016 round of elections. So I'm, I'm positive we can do better than that. If for no other reason than because of COVID, we all maybe have a little extra time on our hands. We'll see how that goes. Uh, Tiffany, let's move to you. And uh, how are you today? And welcome from Saskatoon. You're still muted, Tiff. Thanks, Keith. I appreciate you having me here and Doug and Karen as well. It's a privilege to be speaking with such a distinguished panel. Um, you know, picking up on the last point, uh, the, the day after the American presidential election, the question of why voters should care about a municipal election is pretty timely. You know, the close presidential race certainly highlights the importance of voting and participation. And as a former municipal politician, I may be biased, but I think civic issues are the most important um, to voters. Uh, a municipal council is the body of people that can literally run a highway right through your backyard. So you need to pay attention or voters need to pay attention as to what the direction and the leadership is of their municipal council. And you know, while a, a highway through your backyard may not be likely, issues such as clean water, sewer, policing, fire are all municipal issues and there's critical survival issues. And so the importance of a municipal council and the decisions they make are, are truly fundamental to, in my opinion, to our society. And while they also deal with sort of basic survival needs, um, there's also quality of life issues that are almost uh, critically important as well, or as important, parks, playgrounds for children, libraries, swimming pools, hockey rinks. All of those issues are and topics are the responsibility of a municipal council. And, um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. Well, let's let's take your opening comments as a springboard for my first question to the panel. And being the being in the moderator's chair, I'll use that privilege to pose at least the first one or two questions. I haven't seen anything show up in the group chat yet, so uh, I, I suspect the audience is 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 checking our uh, checking their their opinions of us so far. So we'll see if we can't create some controversy. Let's talk about that uh, uh, though, panel. Why uh, this notion of why voters should care about municipal elections? Tiffany brought out the concept that of all three levels of government, ordinarily people think of the federal and provincial governments as being the senior levels and municipal as being kind of the poor, the poor little brother, little sister of the two big ones. But when you think about it, municipal governments probably have uh, a much higher capacity and much higher tendency to affect your overall everyday lives as citizens. Why is it? that municipal elections are often overshadowed or forgotten about, Deb? Well, you know, people should care about municipal elections because in, you know, a lot of the opening comments, uh, it's that level of government that provides the services that we rely on for day-to-day -day life and quality of life. Uh, we are the closest to taxpayers 
and uh, providing those day-to-day services. Do you know, going from provincial to municipal, it was surprising that people may not know who all their provincial representatives are, but people absolutely know who their municipal level of government is and who they who runs things. So while we look at those basic services that we rely on uh, day to day, those are paid for residents. They seem to take more of an ownership uh, and provide quite a bit more comment, I would say, than what they do provincially or federally for sure. And while those, those uh, responsibilities are growing and there's more things that are coming into play. Uh, hear lots of comments about drugs in the community, about homelessness, about gangs. Um, I mean, just to go in with all the basics that we do have a responsibility for. But also I think that when municipalities make changes or will implement some type of program, there's a quicker time than what you will see from provincial or federal uh, governments. So you see almost an immediate impact, not on everything, but on most things, they will come into play much quicker. And I think we do get overshadowed by the province and by federal politics. It's kind of human nature that we don't pay attention until something impacts me directly. And also we'll hear people talk about their vote doesn't count. And if anything shows that it's that it does count and it is important, it's what we're seeing south of the border right now. Um, but municipal, I think is overshadowed by other layers, layers of government. They're larger, more visible. They have uh, considerably more coverage in the media. And also this year, I think provincial election was way too close to the municipal. Uh, people become immune to the signage and the advertising. Um, I think you almost get, it almost gets overwhelming at times and people almost turn a blind eye to it. It's just blends into the landscape and uh, we carry on with our day-to-day -day lives. So I think for sure this year there is uh, they were just way too close. So people get tired of it. Well, it's uh, in our staff meeting earlier on this week, we were doing our poll our, uh, uh, on who we thought was going to win and what the Electoral College would look like. And several of us said that uh, we just wanted to survive it. We just wanted to get through it and have it be over. So I, I suspect there is some of that. But Mike, well, let's turn it over to you. Uh, we said in our promotional materials that maybe one of the reasons why people don't vote in municipal politics is there's this pervasion or pervading no notion that, you know, you just can't fight City Hall. Is that true? No, I look at it just the opposite. Um, but I'll step back first. If I could do a survey with all the people here, if I could see everybody by a show of hands, my guess is that every single one of them would know exactly to the penny probably how much property tax they pay this year or next last year. But if I ask that same group of people in front of me, how much income tax did you pay? I would bet that if they could come within 20% of what it is, they would have done really well. So there's a consciousness in terms of how we affect them every day, but it's really in terms of finances and, and as, as one way. The reason that we get overshadowed is that you get inundated by party politics at the provincial and federal election who have lots of fundraising mechanisms. If I wish to go out and run for city council and get my name out there, I'm on my own. Now there are people that can donate or would donate or maybe your mom or your aunt or something, but really and truly you're kind of on your own. So it takes a long time to kind of get a reputation for people being out there. And so while we can talk a lot about being closest to the people, really, I look at it that this is where people can actually affect change because you can run into the counselor or the mayor in the grocery store and have the conversation, which happens all the time. You can show up at council and be heard directly and you can actually probably have some effect on the policy that is running your city in terms of road repair or alley repair, those types of things. So huge impact on a daily basis. Thanks, Keith. 
Thanks, Michael. Let's move uh, to you, Tiffany. You you alluded to some of the some of your uh, thoughts around this issue in your opening remarks, and I note that Nancy in the chat section says when she's talked with people in her area of her city, uh, and they and they ask her why they should vote, she says that municipal issues face us directly, such as why do you, do you want play parks? Do you want do you want your roads fixed? Do you want to know where your taxes go and so on? Uh, what what do you say to folks when uh, when you when they just kind of express this frustration. Thanks, Keith. So from my perspective, and, and perhaps it's because I live in Saskatoon, I actually don't find municipal elections or, or uh, topics are forgotten about. And, and perhaps it's because Saskatoon doesn't have a legislature. Um, when I was on council, we often lamented about how civic issues dominated local media uh, in Saskatoon. And we, we kind of wish some days it didn't. Um, so... Um, but I am interested, I'm glad we're doing this forum in a university setting because I will say voter turnout amongst younger folks in municipal elections actually is often lower in other levels of government. And I'm speaking to the 30 and under crowd. Um, and it's really until you become a homeowner and start paying property tax, often folks don't pay attention to municipal governments uh, and, and municipalities need to do a better job of engaging future leaders. And I think that's a specific of target audience that, that leaders need to, to put some thought into. Um, the other thing is, uh, as mentioned earlier, if you want to run for city council, you just throw your name in the hat. If you've got 100 signatures and 100 bucks, like you're in. And um, it, that's, that's a hard, um, it's hard for voters to discern what really are issues and whether uh, candidates can truly deliver on promises that they are making because there is all sorts of wild claims about, you know, eliminating tax increases or canceling projects and no one candidate has the authority to do that. And it's, you know, if, if Scott Moe or Ryan Miley form a majority government, they can absolutely deliver on whatever promises they, they have chosen to hold the campaign because they have the ability to do so in a majority government situation. No one single candidate, whether it's mayor or councillor, can deliver on anything they've put on their uh, brochure unless they've got, in our case in Saskatoon, a six of 11 votes at a council table. So it's, it's hard for voters to figure that out, particularly when you have newer folks running who may not understand uh, what they say uh, may not ever happen and, and actually might look quite r ridiculous once they get to a council table. Thanks, Tiffany. Malcolm, let's move to you on this now. Um, uh, what, are you, what is your experience both in Humboldt and, and from your experience with talking with other mayors around the city mayor's caucus table? Is it true? Uh, have, I, have I got the, the impression wrong that municipal politics uh, is actually more popular at the local level in smaller communities than, in, than I thought? Yes, I think uh, I, I think you are wrong. Uh, I think it is overshadowed, as others have said, no question. Uh, but from the perspective of smaller cities and smaller communities out there, including RMs, uh, I think there's an awful lot of interest. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, uh, you know, I always like how important we are. Uh, the best way to illustrate that as, as councils is what's the first thing you do in the morning when you get up? You flush the toilet and turn on the tap. That's what we're <laughs> responsible for. And I, I think at the local government level out there in uh, right across Saskatchewan, uh, there's a lot of interest in who's going to sit around that council table. Uh, granted, uh, there have been a lot of communities that have elected their mayor and council or their reeve and, and council by acclamation. Uh, but there are some contests out there and some races, and the chances are it's someone you know. It's someone, it could be your neighbor, it could be a friend, it could be the teacher in your school, it could be somebody who has a business downtown, uh, and the chances are you're going to run into them over coffee, at social events, at community events, at the rink, and so on. So I, I think there is a lot of interest, uh, and it's I, I think it's a growing interest because of the challenges we have around infrastructure and sustainability in, in small communities right around the province. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think there is uh, a real feeling out there that there's some important work going on, uh, both through the election and, and the work of councils. 
Well, let's take this a step farther than panelists. Uh, as you've, some of you have noted already, many jurisdictions have uh, uh, intense races going on, both for the seat of mayor and for uh, candidates on city council. Less so in the rural areas, but there are still a number of, uh, of RMs across the province where, uh, where there are some pretty active races going on. Is it because of a resurgence of interest or is it because current councils have really done such a bad job? And in our chat section, um, a, a friend whose name you may recognize, Laurent Mougeot, notes that sometimes recruitment of candidates is a challenge for some communities. And if you're in your remarks, you might want to uh, comment on Laurent's question about about uh, how can we do a better job of compensating local elected officials and what would a formula look like for that if we were gonna do a better job of recognizing the hard work they do. Uh, who's on my list next now? Deb, you start off. Michael, it's, it's over to you for the first comments on this one. Well, uh, Keith, uh, you and I might have a little bit of commonality in this. So uh, a specific story goes like this. About nine or 10 years ago, I identified to my council colleagues that I think maybe we need to look at compensation differently. The ultimate problem here is that by legislation, as a council, you have to determine your own salary, which just makes absolutely no sense to anybody. So after nine years and so on, we agreed that we should hire some really skilled people to review the notion of council compensation. I'm gonna say that again, after nine years. And so it came before council and council at a time of COVID passed it. And all we really did is we moved our salary up to what would be the median to cross Western Canada. Of course, there are candidates running now saying that's horrendous, you shouldn't do that. I'm not gonna accept the salary and all that kind of stuff. But the point is, if you really wanna diversify, you really wanna include young people, you wanna include people who have perhaps young children or that are single parents or all the many other new Canadians that came here, one of the ways you have to start is with some compensation. If I could have my way, provincial legislation would change and there would be independent um, committees made up of labor, university, uh, chamber of commerce and so on, who would review on a timely basis council compensation and that uh, council would not be part of that decision. To me, that's part of the issue. Thanks, Keith. If only, if only we knew someone who had been in that seat and it could have led that at some time. Yes. Anyway, yeah. uh, good points, Michael, and I uh, appreciate that. Uh, Tiffany, we're talking again, uh, kind of a, the, the double thrust here in terms of, you know, lots of candidates running out there. Is that a, uh, is that a good thing? I mean, it's a good thing, but is it, is it a sign of good things because everyone is more interested or is it because of you know, how, what the unrest is out there and uh, maybe compensation is, uh, is related to it? You know, uh, nobody runs for elected office to make money. That's uh, truism for all of us. So I, um, I would be shocked, frankly, if folks are running for the, for the income or the pay attached to uh, public service in elected office. The, um, from my perspective, it's people are running for a combination of issues. One is, is interest and passion. And, and those are the candidates experienced or not that I love. Ones who are truly passionate about their city and their community, and they want to put their own vision forward um, to, to explain how they could make Saskatoon or their municipality a better place. You know, the other driving factor is on, 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 you know, unrest, I guess, uh, with the current decisions. We see this come out even more so, I find, in the mayoralty races where folks, their, their voting records are challenged and, and that's more of a, a hotly contested topic. But, you know, people who they don't agree with the decisions their local councillor has made. Uh, in Saskatoon, we track and report all the votes on all the issues so people have a good sense of where their councillor has been voting. And, um, and if they don't like it, then, you know, that also inspires them to run. But, you know, I think that's okay, too. That's a healthy democracy. Malcolm, Malcolm, we all know that, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, <laughs> compensation may be an issue. What's, what's the scope of that in smaller communities? And do you agree with Mike that, uh, that somebody outside, outside your own council ought to be determining what you get paid? 
On over to you, Malcolm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, I agree with Mike. Uh, and uh, this is an even bigger issue in uh, smaller communities, uh, and I'm sure RMs as well throughout Saskatchewan. I mean, how do you sit around the table and uh, vote yourself a raise and then uh, sit around the coffee table the next day and have to justify it. I, I think for years and years, uh, communities throughout Saskatchewan, uh, mayors, reeds and councillors have been uh, certainly underpaid. And as Tiffany says, nobody comes to the table to, to make money. Uh, but I know in my own experience in Humboldt, there were certainly uh, people who uh, chose to run and then chose or chose not to run, pardon me, uh, simply because, you know, the, the time they were going to need to spend, uh, sometimes away from business, uh, sometimes away from other things, it just wasn't a worthwhile proposition to provide uh, the time and the, and the energy and thinking about the loss of wages and so on uh, when they're doing work for council. So I, I think it's a, a major concern out there. Deb, where are you at on this? <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting this comes up because uh, Moose Jaw City Council just uh, uh, put approved a raise to come into effect uh, January 1st of 2021. And they did the same, the process put together a small committee that looked at what's prevalent in cities of our size and in Western Canada. Anyway, as the raise came forward and was the, the kicker is, right, it has to be approved and accepted by the current council before it uh, comes into play. And the pushback that I heard at the time wasn't, I, I mean, it, there was a little bit of, oh, look how much money they're going to be making. Um, but there again, you've got people that don't understand the amount of time uh, that is put into councils and city city politics, uh, but also why would they accept and put forward a raise when we're in the middle of a pandemic and, you know, people were out of jobs, uh, businesses are struggling. Uh, so there was, there was a little bit of both, but I think the whole pandemic, why, why are you doing it during a pandemic was the big push. So, so, you know, you get, it's kind of quieted down a bit now. Uh, but it'll flare up again once the actual raise comes into effect next January. You know, you, people don't go into this to make money. I have to agree with, you know, the previous comments. Uh, you go in it for all kinds of reasons, but to make money usually isn't one of them, or it's pretty rare, I would think, if it was, because people don't understand the amount of hours you put in and the time and effort, so... I want to take a look at this from a, maybe a bit of a different direction. And as, as Mike uh, was a wink and a nod to me, I had the privilege of chairing the, uh, the commission that, um, that reviewed the compensation paid to elected officials in Regina that we, we did our work over the course of the summer and reported to Regina City Council uh, in August and, and they considered our report in September. But uh, someone in the chat on the chat side talked about diversity and and this notion of uh, not only seeing more uh, female candidates running for office but also more candidates in general that uh, would help our municipal councils become more representative of what Saskatchewan's uh, population is and one of the key reasons why our commission made the recommendations that it did around compensation was to try and remove the financial barrier of people making that commitment to council in hopes that if you were an hourly wage earner or someone who wasn't a real estate agent or a retired teacher, you could then perhaps afford to become part of a city council or a municipal council because you were going to be compensated and you would be have to take time off from your regular job to do all this work. Let's talk about diversity for a minute from those two perspectives. One is, is the money an issue and two, both from a policy perspective and just from a uh, it's the right thing to do perspective. How can we encourage more diversity at the municipal level on council? And uh, I think uh, if I remember correctly, Tiffany, you're up first for this one. Thanks, Keith. Uh, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart that I often speak about. Um, 
And so we're fortunate here in Saskatoon, six of the 11 members of the council are female, but of course we've never had a leader uh, at the top and we have not had a female mayor in our fine city. Um, and so, you know, and, and with all due respect to the current candidates that are running, um, you know, we don't even have a female candidate in the race uh, for mayor. And so, you know, I often uh, speak about uh, you can you can be what you see. So it becomes difficult for uh, women who are interested in leading our city uh, to, you know, they don't see that type of leadership or, um, you know, folks running in that position. So that that's, you know, an area that we need to start to focus on. The other thing, um, and not just from a compensation after you win perspective, it's getting people to run in the first place. I mean, that's the critical issue. In Saskatoon, the budget to run for mayor is about $200,000. That's big dollars if you want to run a serious mayoralty campaign. And, and there is no doubt uh, for sure the top three candidates that are running in Saskatoon will spend that amount of money. They all did last time. They will do it again this time. And so that's you know, that's an issue for anybody running for mayor, but certainly um, definitely a barrier for uh, women running for mayor. We all know that women are traditionally uh, carry more of the sort of child care home uh, responsibilities. You have a council that typically meets in the middle of the day and the public meetings at night are in demand as well. So trying to juggle all of that, uh, unless you have a very significant support system in place is a tremendous challenge. Uh, for women running and uh, we and also from a from a further diversity perspective just um, from a you know we have a lack of indigenous representation at city council uh, and and all sorts of uh, we have all sorts of amazing uh, and and diverse comers to Saskatoon who um, to have a place at that table as well. I think that starts with educating folks about our municipal system, actually uh, engaging them on. There are probably 40 committees uh, that the city of Saskatoon runs um, to start to engage those folks at that level so that there's a comfort uh, with City Hall so that they can start to move into those leadership roles. Malcolm, you're next up on this one. Okay, yeah. Uh... <laughs> Uh, great comments, Tiffany. Thank you. Uh, and uh, a number of those things, I think, uh, relate to uh, smaller communities as well. And the, the way I'd uh, approach this question is sort of kind of from the standpoint, and I'm kind of looking back at my own experience, thinking about the things that I didn't do. And, and now being older and wiser, <laughs> thinking, you know, should have done some of those things when I was a member of council. And, and one of the things that comes to my mind in terms of uh, trying to build diversity on your council is we have to start working on this, not just when there's an election. I, I think councils have an obligation to be thinking about uh, this topic and talking about it. I like the notion of it's almost like secession planning. And I noticed in the, uh, in the uh, SUMA convention of uh, last April, there was a particularly interesting topic. It was called a blueprint for council succession planning for diversity and youth. So uh, hats off to SUMA for, uh, for including that kind of a, a session in their program. And I, I also you know, want to acknowledge the work FCM has done for a number of years, uh, both through their uh, different kinds of committees that they've had, uh, uh, they've had uh, diverse voices, uh, advancing equity and inclusiveness. They've had a women in local government committee for many years uh, working on strategies uh, uh, to, to bring the gender balance uh, to, a, to a more positive uh, uh, level. Uh, but the key to me is I think councils have to take this on as one of their responsibilities and not just when it's election time. Deb, does that follow with uh, the way things were occurring in Moose Jaw when you were there? Well, um, a city that's, what, 115, just about 120 years old, and I was the first female mayor in the city of Moose Jaw. Um, do you know our progress? We have had some progress on equity, but certainly it hasn't been consistent progress, and it's been pretty sporadic. Uh, at times we've had councils where we've had good representation uh, of, of our female population. 
and then other times it just basically disappears. Uh, this discussion has been around forever and we need to, to discuss Indigenous representation and also new Canadians or newer Canadians and their representation. And I think it gets back to, I mean, Tiffany made some really good comments uh, that we need to have better education and a better understanding of what municipal politics is and how our representation works. Um, and also councils. I think this has to come through some of our existing councils. You know, Malcolm talked about the work that's been done by SUMA and, but it stops at convention. We don't see anything else that feeds out of that through the council. Uh, so I think that has to be a bigger priority. Uh, education and a bit of outreach, well, lots of outreach actually to community groups so they understand how the process works and what opportunities there are and the need for them to be more involved in the community at that level. So people need to have a better understanding of what the roles are, the responsibilities are, and the jurisdiction. And also it feeds into a responsibility to vote. I mean, that's part of your part of your connect too, is that people need to be aware and understand that responsibility. Mike, I'm going to ask you to take uh, to, to refer back to your previous or your earlier comments about policy and and it's the the idea that came up in the chat function around uh, diversity and um, and having a more diverse slate of candidates and people on council will add to our policy capacity and add to our policy creativity. Do you think that flies? Absolutely, it does. I'm going to cite an example. Tiffany may recall this, but I I thought uh, when I first saw that a, a woman uh, brought a baby to city council. Yes. <laughs> that, and you, you may recall that, Tiffany. But I have a slight recollection did, of that event, yes. <laughs> what that did yeah, for yeah. me, it softened the whole area. Kids were welcome. That meant to me that if you could bring a child in, that anybody else should feel more welcome. That's one of the reasons why. We can talk about all sorts of programming and so on, but until there's opportunity, nothing's gonna change. So I would suggest to you that the notion of a reasonable salary will help. And I don't mean just women or women with a child, but all of those new Canadians who I'm seeing step up in our community. So there are some, that's one. Two, council can put together some uh, committees. They, they wanna have advisory committees. But you can make sure those committees start the diversity process, introduce those people into the, I'll say, the form of government at the city hall, and maybe then they start to feel a little bit more empowered. But to me, there is one key thing that has to happen. It's called term limits. These are not career positions. When I hear that someone's done it for 25 years or whatever, honestly, I'm not all that impressed. I think after three terms, you've had your chance. I think after three terms that you have other people that can kind of have an opportunity then to step up. Now I say this from a personal level and I realize that probably many of my colleagues don't agree. I felt after being on council for a couple, three years that I had a responsibility. So I went out and I tapped shoulders of people and said, please run for city council. Here's what it's like. And by the way, you can run against me. This is not about me or that this is about my community. So I feel that I have a responsibility to be one of the ones that champions this notion when I'm elected. So I know that that's, you know, a little bit about, uh, um, as, as Malcolm referenced about, uh, you know, who's going to take your place and so on. I think that's one of the ways to do it. To the notion of policy, Keith, because that was your fundamental question, different voices, different backgrounds, different skill sets mm -hmm. only makes policy better. We have everything to win on this. Thanks. Thanks. And if I might be allowed a bit of an editorial comment, I'm going to make one anyway. Two, actually. First of all, it's, it is a revelation to me that it costs $200,000 to mount a campaign for mayor. Oh. Aside, 
aside from the fact of me not probably wouldn't be any good at it, that would be the kicker for me. I would never run for public office just from that alone. Second of all, uh, I, I think that this notion of diversity needs to follow through and, and come into the to the ranks of your civil service and the, the ranks of employees for of our municipalities as well. Uh, it, we all need to do a better job of being more diverse. All right. So end of that end of that advertisement. Let's move on to something that uh, other people will want to getting their teeth into, and that's jumpstarting the economy. We're in the middle of a pandemic, folks. Uh, you know, we just uh, had a, a beginning on Friday. We've got Regina, Saskatoon, and Prince Albert with mandatory masks. We've we've uh, had our federal government roll out any number of support programs to try and keep small businesses in particular and larger ones too, uh, vibrant and, and, and alive through this piece. What can cities and towns and RMs do to help the economy recover? Malcolm, you're back up first again. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, I just want to echo uh, Mike's comment about uh, term limits. Uh, certainly support that before I go on. And uh, when I finished uh, three terms as mayor uh, and people asked me why I didn't run again, my answer was often, uh, it's kind of like the grocery store. There's a best before date. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that's true in, in, in being part of organizations. Uh, you have a chance, you give it your all, uh, but there's also time to move on to other areas. Back to the economy, very important, uh, uh, a really important topic right now. And I, again, I'm coming from a, a perspective of uh, smaller communities uh, uh, across the province and uh, some of the things that are, are, are going on. Uh, you know, my first reaction to the question is, uh, it, it's all about partnerships. It's all about working together. And as a council looking at uh, economic development issues in your community and business retention, expansion, and those kind of topics, uh, councils cannot do this alone. And uh, uh, my first strategy is you've got to bring people together. You've got to bring your business community together. You've got to bring some community groups and organizations together. And you've got to start talking about uh, what are the challenges, what are the issues, what are the opportunities. And, and I think this is incredibly important now. Uh, especially for some of the community organizations, not just uh, small business in our communities, but um, all of those organizations like, uh, you know, the community rink, the legion, the community halls, the senior center. Uh, I mean, they've been operating with very little, if any, uh, revenue coming in. They still have all the expenses they usually have. And uh, I expect at some point they're going to be turning to their local council for some support and assistance. So, I think it's really important uh, for communities to start coming together and also working with other communities. And, uh, you know, the Saskatchewan Economic Development Association has got so many good resources to support uh, communities to take on sort of economic development projects, uh, organizing themselves, uh, working with other communities. So uh, I don't, I think they're an underused resource in our, uh, uh, our community and really want to put a plug in for the Saskatchewan Economic Development Association. I, I see a couple of real bright lights out there. There's a number of others. I'll just give example of two in my area. The Mid-South Municipal Alliance has got a great project going on in cooperation with our local chamber, in cooperation with the community college. And this is uh, an association of uh, 13 or 14 municipalities, uh, villages, Towns, City of Humboldt, RMs, and uh, they're working on developing a, a really strong business uh, uh, inventory that's accessible and they're branding the region and doing a number of interesting projects. And I read recently about a great project up in the Nipawin Carrot River Hudson Bay area where they're focusing on, on tourism opportunities and doing some major promotions. Those are just two examples and I know there are many others out there. But the key to me is people have got to start talking about the issues and, and coming together. And as a result of that, they have to develop some plans, some strategic planning and create some action plans, take some step forwards. Uh, we can't wait for this to happen to us. We have to be proactive and, and not reactive to what's going to be uh, coming down the pipe as a result of COVID over the next few years. Thanks, Keith. 
Thanks, Malcolm. I'm going to move to Deb now and ask for your opinion. But uh, if you're a member of a municipality out there and, and you've uh, and your ears perked up at Malcolm's mention of a planning and uh, an intermunicipal cooperation and this notion of working more closely with your neighbors, uh, jump onto the government, uh, the Ministry of Government Relations website and look up targeted sector support. There's some resources there that we put into place towards the end of my tenure as ADM. And, uh, and there, is, there, there is some help out there for you if you're looking to embark on something like that. But Deb, what, this notion of jumpstarting the economy, Musha looks like it's doing pretty good. Do we need to worry about it? Uh, yeah, we do. Do you know, every time you're out and about uh, people, one of the comments you get all the time is, I can't wait to get back to normal. And I don't know what normal is going to be once we have a vaccine and this thing starts to get under control. Things are opening up slowly, but people, I think on, the, on a, a vast majority are still pretty cautious about where they go and what they're doing. So I don't think the normal that's coming is going to be quite what we're wishing for. And all you have to do is have a look around over the past nine months of uh, all of this COVID issue. Travel has changed. It's down to only an absolute necessity. Work has changed. As we can see, everybody's at home or working some combination of work and office. Education quite often is on a part-time school, part-time online, or maybe all online. Shopping, we're heading in the direction of, of uh, shopping online. That's happening more and more often. So some areas of the economy seem to be doing not badly. Real estate, vehicle sales seem to be up. Retail sales, uh, from what I'm hearing, are down. So all of a sudden, if things change, are really nine months of our habits going to change that quickly? I don't think so. So I'm, I was very happy to hear what, what uh, Malcolm talked about doing the regional consultations because I really think councils need to be discussing this now with their business community and also within the region because you have to include the rural municipalities when you're doing these kind of, of projects because they're important to the economy in Moose Jaw the surrounding area. Uh, so you really need to be sitting down and looking at what's needed, what can be done, what is our future gonna look like and what's our new normal? I mean, obviously uh, rural areas are gonna be struggling with the whole, do we have the broadband? Do we have the internet access? Because that's important. Um, but you know, it, it needs to be something looked at on a regional basis and you need to know what's needed out there before we start jumping to conclusions about when we, what we can and what we can't do. And all of this information and regional discussions really needs to go to the appropriate department provincially or ministry provincially, right? Uh, because they're the ones that are, are gonna help coordinate. So if there is information on the government website, uh, we need to start looking at it and talking about it and thinking about it now, not waiting until whatever happens in the future. There are a ton, thanks Deb, there are a ton of resources at the provincial level. Some of my former colleagues being experts in this area, uh, one of them is online with us this afternoon, Amanda Wilcox. So if, if, if you're really looking for somebody to talk to this uh, in the short term, just private message Amanda, she'd be happy to respond to you. Mm -hmm. Mike, let's, uh, the hospitality sector seems to be suffering uh, quite badly. We talked, uh, lots of talk in Regina during the mayoral debate about uh, attracting events. Uh, is that even something we need to look at anymore? Or are we going to, uh, you know, are we going to be looking at the metropolitan area of Regina as being our, uh, you know, our, our visitors and tourists are going to come from Eden wall not from calgary anymore well there's certainly some truth to that keith that in the short term that's probably it and i've seen advertising coming out of saskatoon and Saska tourism that mm -hmm. that's the case i'm going to just jump back first and i'll give you uh, three thoughts on how about jump starting the economy to the notion of regional uh, um, uh, cooperation i think the question is what should we do the question should be more why aren't we it's not a question of whether it should, well, let's work at that. No, 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 that's the expectation. That's called being efficient. Uh, second thing is that we are a bricks and mortar operation. That is by property tax, we're dependent on people having buildings and paying property tax. The upside I can tell you 
uh, is that, and, and I hear this from some other cities, is that for the most part, people have paid their taxes this fall. That you know they got that uh, extra break to the end of September. We've all survived in this last well. It's the next year where I think the crunch is going to come. The second thing is, or third thing, sorry, is that we have land as a city. Somehow or other, we end up with some land once in a while. We can leverage that. That might be our way to get housing started. That may be a way that we can partner with, say, the province in terms of building affordable, attainable housing, those types of things. So we need to use that asset of land and, and have that go. Years ago, a sport and culture uh, organizations used to come, in our case, to the city with a handout. We need a new building. Could you just build it for us? I think now that that mentality has changed. We've been able to partner. I'm aware of Saskatoon doing some really good things in recreation uh, where we have gotten local organizations who have great fundraising skills and great people to get involved and we can develop by partnering and have new facilities go, creates job construction, all those things that makes our city better. Actually, the answer to your question, Keith, goes like this for me. Um, while I might worry about uh, the bricks and mortar and paying property taxes, my far greater worry is this notion of having people gather. So I'll just use the simplest one in Regina, the Ryder Games, 33,000 people, lots of mood. People feel great. They get excited and happy. When we don't have that, there's that sense of isolation, that sense of lack of community. It might result in people not reaching out to their neighbor, like we always encourage at the municipal level, our job is to build community. Our job is to get the people to know one another and look after one another. If we don't have that, then I really worry. Not a real good answer, Keith, but that's my worry. Peace, order, good government, and a nice place to live. I should have written <laughs> it in the legislation like that. Tiffany, the last <laughs> word on this economic issue goes to you. Yeah, it's a toughie. Um, you know, certainly we can all take personal responsibility by shopping local, supporting local businesses. Uh, those, you know, these smaller businesses are really struggling in all of our communities and, and trying to make sure that they stay afloat. Um, the other, you know, this is a bit of a, a sort of scary topic because people fly off in all sorts of directions, but infrastructure projects, it's a double-edged sword. Um, but, you know, on one hand, uh, and in Saskatoon, we're talking about a big time in the election. It's the library, it's bus rapid transit, it's do we build a downtown arena, you know, and people have a lot of strong feelings. On the one hand, you know, folks are saying we can't afford this, we can't put this on our tax bill, we don't want to contribute. On the other hand, uh, those projects will create thousands of jobs. And so, and, and you know, infrastructure dollars have been proven to um help with a restart of uh, the economy and help contribute to the economy because those folks, those workers turn into taxpayers who can contribute to our economy. So it's a tough one because there's pros and cons to each of those projects, but it is uh, certainly a topic that um, people need to seriously consider beyond their tax bills as to uh, what the impact of these projects not just during their construction, but upon their completion are going to have on the economy. Okay, thanks for that, Tiff. That's a really good point. Uh, we're gonna talk about, uh, I wanna just take uh, uh, just a time out for, to give our panelists uh, uh, 30 seconds to take a deep breath and a sip of water before we move on to the next question. I wanna foreshadow though, I've gotten a lot of, a, a lot, well, not a lot, three or four people on the chat group function that uh, have suggested that uh, we need to talk about the A word amalgamation. And we need to talk about it in the context of not only recruiting of counselors and efficiency and, and effectiveness, but also from this notion of working together more collaboratively and more cooperatively. So panelists, beware of that. I'm going to ask for your opinions on that in a couple of minutes. Uh, we are going to though, uh, talk first of though about, uh, we're going to switch gears from the economy now and talk about some social issues that we know folks are struggling with. Many communities in Saskatchewan are combating serious social issues, opioid abuse, crystal meth, homelessness, gang activity, 
uh, conversations around things like defunding police and uh, relationships between Indigenous peoples and, and, and other folks in the communities. This is not just a big city issue, but I'd be interested in panelists' perspective on, on, on that from your, from your view, not only just from your home city, but a, a, in general, uh, from a philosophical perspective. What can local councils do to, in terms of improving social policy and, and results in that area? Deb, you're up first. Hmm. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's, an, it's a simple question. <laughs> no, I know. I was How do you not have the answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> I was having trouble turning on my video. <laughs> do you know something? When I was getting ready for this, when uh, we had first talked about that you were setting this uh, panel up and asked me to be a part of it, I started phoning around the province uh, to different people that I know are still there uh, just to see how their communities were doing. And this absolutely is not a big city problem. It is huge in just about every community you talk to. And they're all battling with the problem or the issue of what do you do? And I think some councils are kind of stepping outside of it, uh, thinking the problem belongs to someone else. But in fact, it's municipalities and the cities and uh, that are having to look at options or it's just getting worse. So I was trying to think, and here we get back to working regionally because the surrounding municipalities and the rural municipalities are going to see the overflow from this. They're going to be impacted by it too. So, you know, you batted around, batted around, and I was thinking of the old United Way umbrella type of uh, operation uh, because the United Way in, disappeared quite a while ago. So what we've seen in Moose Jaw is community groups, service clubs, churches that have stepped in to try and fill the gap in certain areas and support these uh, community organizations that are doing the work on the ground. So could the municipality be a bit of an umbrella, a bit of a um, congregating points so that you can have the discussion. What resources do we have? What resources, where's the best place to put them? Um, but is that an opportunity for municipalities? I don't know, but I read with interest what Regina had done, kind of one of their committee, city committees working with the community organizations to provide a bit of coordination and organization. Is that an option for us that live in more rural areas? I think it would be, but it's like any project, you have to have someone who's actually gonna take a hold of it and champion the project, do the work, move it along until it's at a point where you can actually see some benefit of it. Other than that, that's it. Okay, Mike. Um, where are you at on this? I know it's an issue in Regina, but I know you have thoughts on this uh, from a broader perspective as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Keith, if we would step back six or eight or 10 years and this uh, issue was, would have been asked of council, the simple answer would have been, oh, that's not our problem. That's, that's the province, that's health or whatever it is, social services. We don't do anything. That day is long past. Yeah. Um, I think the acknowledgement first has to be that it's a disease. Uh, and that we have to treat it as such. Uh, already uh, fire and police on a daily basis are dealing with this, sometimes multiple daily basis. So we passed a motion uh, the other day at council. I'm just gonna read a few of the things. Uh, a citywide harm reduction strategy, including but not limited to needle drop-off locations, safe consumption sites, safe drug supplies, wellness centers, traditional ceremonial places, detox facilities, supportive housing, and addiction support services, all part of a community well-being and public safety strategy. From there, there's also been discussions about if there are domestic abuse calls, and we all know there are way, way too many of those in our province, that social workers should be the first ones there with the police stepping back, but there, but have the social worker first. Uh, look at the idea of retraining centers, because some of these people have had a few years of tough times, and maybe we can do things like property tax reduction on those to make sure that they 
are viable. And of course, education. I'm going to use a scenario, Keith, to finish how I look at this. So I, when I have talked publicly, and again, this is part of that coming out as a, a teacher, and part of that is coming out as a father, that whole notion of it takes a village to raise a child. We all understand that, and we all, I think, can work toward that because it's logical. I'd use the same notion here. These are real people. These are part of our community. And we can't just distance them away, lock them up and throw them away, but we have to embrace them and look after them. We need to be the ones working with, um, working with uh, our health authorities, but the city clearly has a view here. We can't abstain from this. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Mike. Tiffany, you're up next, and I just want to uh, I want to pre I want to intro your your comments here by making an observation. Saskatoon is not uh, has not come lately to this discussion, uh, as I recall. I'm not sure that they still do it, but years ago, your uh, your city council and administration decided that uh, the the fire service, for example, uh, ought not to uh, ought not to just be in those fire stations all day waiting for a call to come in. Uh, you provided them a direction to tour the communities up and down those back alleys or up and down those streets looking for not only fire safety issues, but also just as being representatives of the municipality. What, what else What else comes to mind to you these days in modern times about the problems, which are arguably much worse than what they were way back then? Yes, I would certainly agree. And um, as Deb mentioned in her, her initial comments, uh, municipalities who typically are the providers of basic services, water, sewer, are now being looked upon to solve uh, greater social issues uh, without, frankly, the resources to do so. But it, it doesn't sort of help the situation just to sort of um, say it's somebody else's problem. So where, and it is, you know, it is a local issue. And so when it's happening, I think the time has come and, and, and has been tried is, is municipalities need to become leaders and leaders in the discussion. They have to join forces with the province on this issue. There is absolutely no way around that. There is no way a municipality could resolve these issues on their own. Um, you know, the defund the police was a, a good a discussion, was a good example, which, you know, really never took off in Saskatchewan. But it, it was a good examination of the issues you're raising. Um, I think most police services, most reasonable police services would actually give up, give up <laughs> precious budget dollars um, if there was a more unified and proactive and joint approach between themselves and the province when they're receiving calls that are really, frankly, not criminal matters. They are mental health issues. They are addictions issues. And, and mental health is not a crime. It res and police officers are not trained in those that they're, they are trained to protect the public and solve crime. And so they, um, they need partners in this. The police should not be the first resort in, in when those types of uh, issues arise. And so we need to figure out uh, from a dollar's perspective how to maximize resources because arresting someone with a mental health issue um, frankly does nothing. Um, it, you know, at its very best, it costs money. Uh, at its very worst, it uh, stig re-stigmatizes an issue. It does not provide a productive solution. And nobody's really interested in resolving mental health and addictions issues that way anyway. So there's no way around it other than a, a cooperative, collaborative approach with other levels of government. And, and municipal councils are going to have to be leaders in that discussion. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with you and with Michael as well that the time for municipal councils to sit back and say, sorry, that's not in a, that's not within our uh, not within our bailiwick is long past. Whether it is or whether it isn't is not the point. The point is it's in your community anyway. Malcolm, what about the perspective from from maybe some from some smaller communities on this? Uh, I certainly agree with uh, uh, with the points that have been raised. And uh, yes, uh, this is an issue out in smaller communities and in rural communities as well. I, I guess, you know, looking back on uh, my time as mayor, we have an organization in Humboldt, a very important organization called Partners. It started many, many years ago, Partners for Rural Family Support, when, when uh, rural uh, communities were in uh, crisis. Uh, it's now called Partners and provides a variety of uh, 
uh, social services supports, mental health supports in our community funded. It's a private work or operated by a board, nonprofit, but uh, relies on some grants and support from the province. And, you know, I invited that group every year to come to council, sometimes a couple of times a year for two reasons. One, it provided council with uh, uh, an educational experience about uh, who the organization was, the work they do, who's involved, uh, what their challenges are, and so on. It also provided some visibility to the uh, to that organization uh, through the press and, uh, and so on by being part of our community or our council meeting. I, I think it's really important. I think councils have a responsibility uh, to invite and connect with uh, the organizations that are doing this work. Yes, it's not mm -hmm. our direct responsibility, but it is our responsibility to be aware of and understand uh, the work that they do, the issues that they're facing. And then perhaps we can also be a voice of support uh, for them directly and also indirectly, perhaps with our local MLAs, perhaps with, uh, with government advocacy efforts in support of those organizations and the work that they do in our community. So I really encourage mayors and Reeves and councils uh, to make sure people from the health services, mental health services, those kind of organizations invited to your council and have discussions with your council uh, about the work that they're doing, the challenges and the, and the progress they're making. Thanks, Malcolm. That's an interesting point. Uh, I know that Cabinet Delegation Day was always uh, a popular event at the provincial level, and I know that, uh, that, that many cabinet ministers actually looked forward with uh, uh, with pleasure to to meeting folks that had and, and it wasn't a case of okay well you know come to us and we'll bestow gifts upon you it was a it was an information sharing exercise and it was a partnership building exercise so I, I like that notion okay panel we're into the last 15 minutes uh, I'm a, I you've got three tasks left one we're going to talk about financial issues two we're going to talk about the the amalgamation and how many municipalities we have because that's what the crowd wants to hear and I want to give each one of you a very brief minute or two at the very end to give any final remarks that you might have so let's uh, let's talk about finances first no forum on municipal issues would be complete without a discussion on money uh, municipal money is going to be tight going forward. Provincial revenue sharing is going to decrease because of uh, a downturn in consumer spending and lower PST revenues as that makes its way through the system. Someone in the chat uh, in the chat area said uh, uh, brought up the issue that uh, municipalities are being asked to do more with less, uh, more with with only ten cents of every tax dollar. How do you prioritize demands on your services? And I want to editorialize it a little bit on this this notion of ten percent. You guys have taxing authorities you need money just raise your taxes it's a simple formula <laughs> and who's up yeah, first running for public office keith i don't yeah. think that was getting that expensive to get you to <laughs> well you know you're you're absolutely right tiffany but it, it's this notion of you know you you control your own destiny don't you right yes. deb you're yes. up first Oh, did you? Now, how did you set this up that I get these ones? Oh, did right you off get? Did back? you get it? Did you go first last time? Okay, sorry about that. I, no, I, I don't. I'm think so I excited did, but... here. Okay, well, <laughs> anyway, it's your it's your turn because uh, you know because I like you best. My video's turned on. <laughs> well, financial impacts, and everyone that I spoke to leading up to this has all commented that uh, they give you the good news about their community to start off with. And then what they turn around and say, but our next budget is who knows where it's going to be. And we really, I mean, you will know what the impact on the provincial PST is and what revenue sharing will adjust to. But also people in city administration don't quite know where their budgets are going to settle out yet. They'll start to know that pretty quick, but they're going to be tough ones. So then councils, and it's going to be new councils, are going to be uh, faced with making some adjustments and whether that's actually cut to services or uh, automatically looking at capital projects. Here we just talked about how do you stimulate, stimulate your economy? You know, you can do infrastructure projects that is kind of a tried and true solution. And I think the feds are putting out some money out there for infrastructure projects. But 
that's also the easiest place to cut if you've got restrictions in your own budget. So hopefully we've been going through years of we need infrastructure, need infrastructure. And then that's the easiest place to cut when it comes to uh, making difficult decisions instead of cutting services. So everybody's worried about it. Um, and I have no idea when you're dealing with new councils where we're going to land on this thing, but it is, it is front and center for everyone at this point in time. Mike, you mentioned bricks and mortar and property taxes. Uh, you and I have had many discussions over the years about the need to perhaps diversify uh, revenue sources for municipalities. Is now the time to have that conversation seriously? Yeah. So um, despite my uh, boyish good looks, I wasn't around in the 1930s. And uh, I, but I referenced that as a starting point because I think there was great wisdom when, the, when times were really, really tough, the then governments and at least in North America, that's when they put money forward for projects that are long-term projects. So I'm gonna at least begin with that notion. We have, there are two programs uh, provincially right now. One is the meat funding and one is revenue sharing. And when the province had a tough time a few years ago, we sat with them through municipal Saskatchewan and renegotiated that. And that's good, that's the way you do things. I would make the argument that those two programs have ever have been important, they're important now, so that we can in fact get people back to work. Um, the notion of, of cutting is the easy part, especially if this is, um, I don't know, if this is your first time on council and you, fit, you know what you're gonna face with property taxes, but the implications of not having a tax, well, a decrease, shall we say, are, are well versed when we look at residential roads and what that means, especially to a place like Saskatoon or Regina. We understand that effect. So I think it's a little bit about explaining to people what's really involved here and so on. For me, it would be more about making sure that we keep those capital programs uh, going alive and well. Uh, at the same time, um, I'm cognizant of the fact that it, it, we really would have to look at services to some degree um, and um, make sure that the people understand that. And maybe that's our compromise as well. Best I can do for now, Keith. Thanks, Mike. Tiffany, municipalities are not allowed to run deficits. They must balance their books on an annual basis. Is it time to uh, get rid of that? No, no, I'm, uh, no. <laughs> Rarely is there, <laughs> no. Uh, I, you know, there are three ways essentially municipalities can receive revenue. One, property taxes, revenue sharing, or direct taxation or fees for services, simplistically put. Um, so I, you know, I don't think the, the public mood uh, is, or perhaps just my own, is not is ready for a deficit financing. I think people would prefer just um, to, to budget and spend the money that they have. I, I do wonder, I think you're entirely correct that lower PST revenues will, will impact revenue sharing, but I wonder if that needs to be the automatic result and there may need to be a discussion with the province that just because PST revenues are declining, um, do, do they really, can they make that up in different ways? They're not gonna like that discussion, but I think it's one that at least needs to be had. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that municipalities are the economic drivers of this province. So if you start harming them, uh, everybody is going to be hurt and, um, and it, it's not going to be a pleasant situation. The other thing too is that, you know, we, we have this conversation all the time in Saskatoon. I remember when I was elected and people would pull me up and say, I can't believe I'm going to pay, I don't know, $3,000 a year in property taxes. That's outrageous. It's, it's too much money. And I would say, well, what if I said, I'm going to lower your property tax bill down to $1,800? And they would be like, that would be amazing. It's such a bargain. And I would say, well, guess what? That is your property tax bill to the city of Saskatoon. <laughs> the rest of that money is going to the education system. And they people would be like, that's, wow. Oh, okay. And, you know, so there's still needs to, and, and actually the, the percentages were flipped when I was elected. It was more of a 45, 55 with the lower end going to the cities. Now it's about, I would say in Saskatoon, 55 to 60% of your tax bill goes to the city of Saskatoon. But people don't understand too, and there needs to be, and that's the fault of the municipalities, there needs to be some better education as to what people are actually paying for and what their true municipal property taxes are. 
Malcolm, what's your perspective on this? It's such an easy question to answer. <laughs> oh, goodness. A couple of quick points. Just in looking at some of the uh, election campaigns out in uh, communities, I was struck by uh, a counselor who wanted to, one of their campaign promises was they wanted to have a dog park like Saskatoon had. This is a community of 800 people wants to have a dog park like Saskatoon has. So one of the things I think we're all dealing with out there, or councils are dealing with and going to be is expectations. And uh, the kind of expectations people have uh, of their local government and, and what those costs are. So I just throw that out there because I think that's an important piece. The other thing uh, that was an eye opener for me and uh, the latter parts of my time as a council or as a as mayor was when we really got into looking at the actual real costs of doing a number of things. Our our water system. We're on the pipeline a contract with Sask Water and so on and so forth. Good quality water, etc. And our community had been dealing uh, with a rate level increase every year um, based on our contract with Sask Water. Uh, and that was fine. Keep those water rates as low as possible, et cetera, et cetera. What we were missing was the actual costs of replacing water lines, upgrading, um, upgrading the reservoir, up creating the whole system of distribution, et cetera, et cetera. No wonder we had this massive infrastructure gap and, and some of that still exists to this day. We weren't dealing with the real actual costs of doing business. And I think there's lots of areas uh, we can be looking at. And uh, so it leads me to, you have to uh, face uh, user fees and user pay notion uh, on everything you do. Uh, and I think that's the kind of information council should be asking for. And I think that's gonna be part of our, our way forward to look at what the actual costs of doing business are in a number of areas. And, you know, I suspect in many communities, uh, small communities especially, uh, they don't have the resources to do that kind of work uh, and get that kind of information easily. Uh, so those are two points I would throw out with the question around finances. Okay, thanks, Malcolm. All right, panel, uh, as I know you've been uh, listening rapidly to your colleagues as they've been discussing these questions, but you've been also making notes for your final comments, which I'll ask you for in a minute or two. Uh, I could see, Mike, I can see you scribbling there as, as you were <laughs> listening. That's good. But one last question, okay, and it's about this, it's about amalgamation. And I, I admit to you, I enter into this discussion with a bit of trepidation. If I I were a braver person, I would turn you around and show you the scars on my back from previous discussions I've had over the years on this. But people have brought it up and I think it's a fair, it's a fair discussion question. We have more than 750 municipalities in Saskatchewan. More than 100 of them have fewer than 100 people in, in population, including kids and in some places dogs. And is it time in this province now for a, for a real discussion about about how we organize ourselves and and entering into a uh, into a governance system that is more designed to be efficient and effective in the 21st century. And uh, let me see, Mike, you're up first. Uh, Malcolm, sorry, Malcolm, uh, Keith. I'm, I must admit that I don't understand this uh, notion of amalgamation or the pushback from it. And so I'm going to be a bit on the negative side. I think this is about power. When you get people into some elected positions and they have some authority over others, they don't want to give that up and they don't, don't want to change. That to me is a big pushback for this. If in your oath when you take office, you understand that you have a, a responsibility for many things, but a fiduciary responsibility primarily, then it is incumbent upon you to look at the most efficient way to operate, not just your system, but those around you. I think you have an obligation to consider amalgamation. I don't understand why we don't. Uh, Tiffany. Oh, you're gonna start off with the two city people's uh, thoughts on amalgamation. That's a bold move, Keith. Because <laughs> uh, I, I agree with Michael, actually. I think this is an issue of, of power. We, you know, we've got what, 800 municipalities in, in a, in Saskatchewan with a population of just over a million. That doesn't make sense to 
to be from a tax perspective, from a um, efficiency perspective. And, you know, the city of Saskatoon, in fairness, is not immune to this debate. The, um, you know, when, when the city expands, the city of Saskatoon expands its own land base, we, you know, are often accused of cherry picking land and trying to, uh, we are uniquely, Saskatoon is uniquely surrounded by Corman Park. And, you know, sometimes the folks over there get a bit agitated when we, um, you know, uh, add land to our, and in fact, it was one of the first issues I faced as an elected person when we added the willows in. But um, the reality is, is the city of Saskatoon is the only game in town in terms of delivering all, a full level of services from uh, sanitary sewer and all those types of things. And so if, if those developments want to occur, they need to be a part of the city of Saskatoon. And frankly, I think it's improves the overall quality uh, of life and the economy for not just Saskatoon, but the surrounding communities as well. And it's just simply a reality of our future. Malcolm. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, why aren't we? Uh, why are we struggling so much with uh, this question? Uh, you know, I look at the regional district uh, model in British Columbia, I look at the county model uh, in Alberta, um, and, and I see the kind of uh, work and processes that, uh, that they undertake and what they do and how they do it and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, and then I look at our Saskatchewan model and, and I see very small villages. Uh, I see RMs with uh, populations of 200 or less. Uh, we have some small towns. Um, we just don't have the capacity uh, in many cases uh, to deal with some of the issues. Uh, as I mentioned before, looking at something like what are their real actual costs of doing business, doing uh, business case analysis of uh, uh, various things. Uh, uh, looking at the kind of uh, tendering uh, processes and purchasing policies that we have and so on and so forth. I, I just don't understand why uh, we're not looking more closely at this. Uh, I, you know, it's certainly in my time uh, with the city mayor's caucus, I think we had many conversations around the table about what I then called and still call the donuts around the cities. Uh, you know, there's a whole development going on out there uh, using Humboldt, for example. Uh, we have a number of uh, rural acreage developments, a uh, couple of lakeside developments out there. And, I, and I'm not being critical of those developments by any means, but it's like we have these little villages growing around us. And uh, there is no support for... Uh, uh, recreation and cultural activities and some of the other kinds of infrastructure uh, from those communities uh, uh, around us. And so, and that has significant impacts. Uh, I've used this example before, 30 or 40% of the kids who play hockey, baseball, soccer in Humboldt live in the rural areas around us. And, and the taxpayers of the city of Humboldt are picking up the cost for it all. Now, there are other ways other than amalgamation of creating the kind of partnerships with the RMs and so on around us that would help address some of those issues. And, and that would be a great step forward. But you still got to ask the question of, you know, when I look at the regional district model and the county system model, uh, why we aren't also looking at a different model. Thank Deb, you. You, Deb, you come at this with uh, a variety of perspectives as well from your uh, from your seat in the legislature formerly and and from mayor. Uh, Mushja is not not so big that this hasn't been a concern too, has it? No, it hasn't, and I think I got a few of the scars too. It seems to me I might have <laughs> a few here and there. Um, do you know I agree with the comments that have been made when we're looking at resources being tight, demands being higher. Uh, so many of the things we do already are done on a regional basis. The things that we don't do should be done on a more regional basis. It just makes sense when you look at um, the area we cover and the population that we have. It just would be better services to everyone and a better, better use of those uh, tight resources. So. 
Do you know, when I sit here and talk about Moose Job and working in the municipal government and not having the resources that the bigger cities, Saskatoon and Regina will have, and not just financial, but also research and policy development, um, it's got to be even worse in some of the smaller rural municipalities. Um, dealing with federal government, dealing with federal government programs, dealing with provincial government programs. Um, it's a mind boggling maze at times as to how they're all parceled. Um, it just makes sense that we're working on these issues on that regional basis. Does it have to be amalgamation? I don't know, but um, even in a regional basis, it could be done more efficiently and effectively than what we are today. Okay, panel, thanks for that. I'm going to make one comment about amalgamation while you assemble your notes for your closing remarks. And that is, uh, from my perspective, uh, the resistance against amalgamation and consolidation is, uh, is basically one of fear and of, uh, of the unknown. And in many cases, it isn't that broken. It really doesn't need fixing. And I believe it is the system's responsibility, the municipal sector and the province working together, to enable the development of an alternative governance structure that uh, has possibly elements of regional uh, activity in it, uh, allows communities to maintain some autonomy and some uh, and some sense of self around that. You know, it, it's it's a cliche, but that that sign on the highway that says, you know, this way to Girvan is still an important part, or maybe Girvan is not a Mitchelton where I grew up. I mean, Mitchelton hasn't been there for 30 years and there's still a sign there. We still consider ourselves a community, but uh, I do think that part of it is, is uh, local folks not, uh, not having the confidence or the resources to be able to embark on that sort of a discussion on their own. And I believe it's, it's up to the system to try and figure out a way of enabling that discussion to be had and to do it in a way that's not threatening, that to do it in a way that is, that is facilitation based. And, uh, and then we're, we're going to find some, we're going to find some folks that are brave enough to take the first step. And once, and once you've got some folks into the water, there will be others that are willing to go. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to keep my remarks very short now. Thank you very much panel. The last word belongs to you and uh, we are back uh, to, uh, halfway through our, my speaker's order. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell, uh, you have uh, one minute to uh, make some closing remarks. Thanks very much. Um, one of the things I've learned in my 14 years is that I have great respect for people who will put their name forward and serve on their community councils. And I think the people that you have selected on this panel are people that I respect greatly and are, are the type of people that step forward and serve their community well. So I compliment the, the folks that are here. When I got into this, I got into it because of people. I have great, great respect for people who work in municipal government, those staffs that take it on. And uh, I have met so many people that I would have never had the chance to do who are residents who had a concern and we have become uh, friends and, and allies. It's a great learning experience. I had a chance to shape my community. I'll be forever grateful. And thanks for including me today. You're very welcome. Tiffany, thank you for being here with us today. What's your last word? What, what did you not get a chance to say that you really got to get out there? Um, first of all, I also want to thank uh, you, Keith, for putting together this panel. It's such a, frankly, such a lively discussion. Uh, and I really, uh, really appreciate the time and the effort that was put towards uh, putting the panel together. Um, you know, and I also will be remiss, uh, voting day is on November 9th. So please, all of you out there, if there is a critical message to take from this is A, how important municipality issues are and B, vote uh, on November 9th. And lastly, um, you know, one thing I would like to address is this issue of social inclusion. I think it's a critical issue facing our times today in how to, even if people aren't running in the election, how to engage all sectors of our population in the discussion about municipal issues. I think it's critical. Uh, municipalities uh, have traditionally, re often repeatedly heard from the same folks at public gatherings and public meetings. And now, uh, particularly in pandemic times, I think uh, municipalities are forced to rethink how they engage the public. And it's a critical issue of our time. We have so many levels of disenfranchised populations and the time has come to make sure that we are hearing from everybody and everybody is included in the discussion and it's going to make us all stronger and better in the end. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Malcolm, uh, my friend who lives just down the street now from me, uh, we're, if we're going to go for coffee later, that's great, but you've, uh, you've got a minute here. Okay. I, again, I'd, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. I, I really enjoyed this and uh, nice to connect with, the, uh, with you and the other panelists. I, I guess my, uh, I, I want to stress as a final comment how important our, our two uh, municipal organizations are. Municipalities of Saskatchewan, uh, uh, which I've called SUMA several times during this, uh, uh, this event, uh, Municipalities of Saskatchewan and SARM. These two organizations have got some tremendous people working for them and provide some tremendous services. And I think they're gonna be more important than ever as they lead us through uh, some of the challenges uh, that we've talked about today. And, uh, and I would add FCM to that list. Uh, Saskatchewan has had a strong presence at FCM. And I just wanna acknowledge that. Uh, uh, these are important organizations in the municipal world of the country and our province, and, and uh, I always appreciated the work that they did. Thanks. Here, here, Malcolm. Deb, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Uh, any final parting thoughts? You know, I, uh, I have enjoyed retirement, but I have to say getting together with everyone and spending this time, I miss the work I miss the people and it really has been a pleasure to be able to spend this little bit of time with everyone. And I hope that we've been able to impart a few ideas or a few points to ponder for anyone that's joined this. Uh, the municipal sector is unique. Um, and it really is important to the province and the working of the province and the success of the province that that municipal sector operates the way it can and the way it should. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Always appreciated SUMA or municipalities of Saskatchewan, whichever they're going by these days, and also SARM. Um, they are do have an important function in the province and uh, yeah, I miss seeing everyone and working with everyone. So thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if, I, if I'm a member of the staff of municipalities of Saskatchewan or SARM and I'm looking for people for our blue chip task force on solving problems, I just think all you need to do is look at, and not me, but these four, and, <laughs> uh, and you've got some prime members. Listen, folks, we hope you enjoyed today's presentation. It has been a load of fun. Uh, for me anyway, and you know, my wife and, and my family just think it's so strange that I love doing this kind of stuff. But <laughs> the, the discussion was fantastic. Thank you so much to our panelists. If you enjoyed this, I want to put a bug in your ear. Uh, on November the first, on the November the fifth, we're we're hosting an innovation forum on the topic of radon in Canada, public attention influencing policy, and assuming there is going to be something to discuss on Thursday, we are going to have a U.S. election panel where our expert panel mem me members of uh, Marshall Auerbach, Cheryl Camillo, and and uh, Lori Hausegger will discuss how the results of the U.S. election might affect Canada. So anyway, with that, thank you so much. Thanks to Karen uh, uh, Jasser LaForge for being. Our, uh, the net under all of us uh, crazy technophobes here. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here. It was our pleasure seeing and chatting with you today. Uh, Karen, you can take us home.